This is More Than Money with Mapalo Marku, brought to you by Sasfin Wealth. Welcome to More Than Money. I'm Mapalo Marku, a personal finance columnist, and I love having money conversations that change people's perspective about finances. Why am I doing this podcast, you might ask? To talk about money. Not the paper stuff. I mean the baggage, the feeling, the emotional, heart-wrenching stuff. We find this conversation so uncomfortable to have. Which is why on this podcast, I have decided to have this very difficult conversations. We are going to scratch. We are going to have some difficult discussions because better money conversations lead to better money confidence. And healthy money dialogue leads to healthy money decisions. Today, I'm joined by DJ Boom, a prominent South African DJ, music producer, and entrepreneur. Welcome, DJ Boom. Uh, hello, everyone. How are you doing? Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. We have so much to talk about. But first things first, give us a bit of background. Did you always want to be a DJ growing up? And how easy was it to get into the industry? It started out, it's, cra- it's crazy because I'm actually recording this interview while I'm at my mother's house. I'm in Tembisa. Uh, this is exactly where the dream started many years ago when I was a kid. I used to walk around here in the streets. And I used to tell these guys that one day, well, in township language, I used to say, uh, meaning, um, one day, guys, I'm going to be famous and I'm going to get all of you guys women. <laughs> Because when we were young, that used to, um, that just used to be our chat as little young guys in the township. We just all cared about fun um, and girls and nice cars and clothes. Although we couldn't afford the cars at the time, we just had dreams, you know. Uh, I used to play tennis and I used to love nice clothes. I used to do a lot of window shopping on weekends when I had money, month end, especially when my parents had money. They'd hook me up and I'd go for window shopping, go to Ozzy. Um, small street wasn't the current small street that you know in Johannesburg, CBD. It used to be full of designer stores. There used to be a lot of designer clothes there. And we used to walk around Joburg and walk all the way down to Carlton Center and just look at all the designer clothes, etc. So we were fascinated by clothes. We used to buy my GQ magazine, our Esquire magazine to keep us updated with the latest fashion trends. And I just wanted to be the singer uh, and a DJ. I couldn't sing to save my life. I still can't. But um, I was like, whatever whatever one happens, I just want myself to be around music. I want to be around radio. I want to be around um, that type of an entertainment music environment, you know. So that was me as a kid. You know, little did I know that, um, yeah, uh, my dreams will come true one day. Did you discuss money around the table at home growing up with your parents? Money conversations with my parents were, were almost every day because I used to have a spaza shop. The spaza shop I used to sell. So every time after school, I'd be selling. So we used to discuss money because we used to call it cashing up. So at the end of the day, like maybe around three, yeah, around this time, yeah. I'm back at school. I start selling from now until around Boma 7 every day. This was me every day. And then on weekends, I used to go Gilo Stalker. Gilo Stalker means you go to get products for your store. So we used to have a little store, which is called a spaza shop in, in South African terms. And I used to sell at my spaza shop, which my parents made it my responsibility to sell there. We used to sell cigarettes, loose drawers, sweet chappies. We used to sell bread. We used to sell cake flour. We used to sell cold drinks. Uh, we never just, we, the only thing we never used to sell was alcohol, but we used to sell everything, like the necessities, you know, painkillers, cigarette lighters, you know, the, the basic necessities that people buy on a daily basis. Yeah. And then also used to sell some fruits, apples, um, oranges, bananas, that type of stuff. And I used to sell to taxi drivers. I also used to sell to the community around. That forced me to have the money conversation with my parents because per day, I remember on a bad day, would make anything from 300 to 500 rands a day. This was over 20 to 30 years ago. On weekends, we used to make about a thousand, thousand two, and then on month ends, weekend of month ends, we used to make anything between a thousand five hundred to two thousand rands. This was per day, and this was for the um the store that I was in charge of, which was the spaza shop. So that basically 
was the reason why I had to consistently have money conversations with my parents. Because when you're packing up, you're checking how much you sold, how much stock is remaining, how much money was made for the day. I would say that's how the entrepreneurial bug bit me because I was forced to sell. Yeah. I didn't even like it. At the time, I didn't like it. Like, I just wanted to go play with other kids. It's after school. But I was forced to sell. Little did I know that I was being groomed to be an entrepreneur. I find it fascinating when we are going through something, for example, with you having to sell at the Spiza shop and you're thinking to yourself, why do I have to do this? All my friends are playing. And yet you didn't know just how much it's going to add to your entrepreneurial journey, um, to you being a hustler and succeeding in business. Do you think when you look back that you can say, you know what, I'm proud that, yes, I might have wanted to play like other kids, but I'm actually proud that I have that type of background. Definitely. I'm, I'm so glad now. You know, it's not only the entrepreneurship stuff. It's the older you become or the older you get, the more you understand a lot of the things that your parents are protecting you from, a lot of the things that your parents were helping you to achieve or they were helping you to become a, a certain person. With a lot of aspects of life, you know, you get to understand things better when you're a parent yourself or later on as you grow older. Um, it's only now that I'm just grateful that my parents had to play that role in my life. Yeah. Because I don't know where, where I would have learned entrepreneurship because I didn't learn it at varsity. You know, I just became like that because even after uh, running a spaza shop, when I graduated from high school and I was at tertiary, at tertiary I used to sell um, cell phones. So I used to come to the township, buy the cell phones. Some of them would be blocked. <laughs> I'd go on campus and sell the cell phones. And I'm not proud of saying that some of them would be stolen, right? I never used to steal. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a criminal, mm. but I used to buy them from people who would steal them. I used to buy them for like next to nothing, for like 50, uh, what is it, 90 rand, 150, 200 rand, 350, 500 rand, depending on what it was. At the time, I remember the most expensive stock that I would have, we used to call it the Nokia Banana. Uh, it's many years ago. I don't know yeah. if it was maybe before your time. <laughs> we used to call it the Nokia Banana. I used to open up like this. That was the most expensive phone. So I would buy that one yeah. for like maybe five or 600 and I'd always negotiate and I would sell it for like 1,005, 2,000. Uh, there used to be a Motorola, very heavy Motorola phone back then. There used to be Alcatel phones. Yeah, man, like all sorts of different phones. And sometimes... I would find myself selling a blocked phone and the person comes back a few days later and I'd be dodging them. I used to stay in a round building in Joba called Ponte City in Hillbro, Berea. Yes. Yeah, sometimes they'd be looking for me for like a week or two and I, I've, I've used the money <laughs> to buy more stock so I don't have the money to give it back to them. And I'd always find ways to stall for time and then when I eventually meet them, I've got their money, I apologize. I, I would always find a way to not necessarily refund them but I'd always try and find a way to, yeah, I'd find a solution for them. I used to call it, I mean, even now in business language, they call it food stoots, like you buy it as is. It's your problem if it comes with problems. So, I mean, I used to use this language, yeah, or, um, meaning, I used to And I remember that's how I was taught by my moms at the Spaza shop, because, when I would mm. sell something and maybe somebody comes back to try and return it, my mom used to always say, find another thing to sell back to them. If, they, if, if maybe you can't exchange it for them, recommend something else and give it to them rather than you taking the money back. See, those are the little things that I, I grew up with. And subconsciously, uh, as the years go by, you get to understand that those are some of the lessons that you grew up with and they are very essential and vital in business. No, absolutely. So now let's go back to when you got into the music industry, the entertainment industry. Obviously, I can imagine getting into it was not the easiest, as most journeys are not. But once you sort of started unlocking those doors, do you remember your first big paycheck and what you did with it? Uh, Esan, you know... You do the, the ordinary stuff that we advise young people not to do, you know. Um, mm. I love clothes, so I'd buy expensive clothes up until, you know, I started growing in the industry and I'd started becoming famous and then I started getting offered clothes for free. But I used to buy a lot of expensive clothes, sneakers, shoes, 
buy nice cars, you know, so, so you can be seen around on the roads, you can be the man, you know, the normal stupid things, and I wouldn't call them stupid, maybe, because I, I don't want young people mad at me, because I'm from there, and, you know, I, I indulge in all of those things. But over time, you get to understand that those are not, those are not the most important things to acquire when you get money. But luckily, I was clever. I mean, I didn't, I wasn't even drinking. So I've always been sober minded up until age 30. So because I never used to drink alcohol and I started making money in my early 20s. And the reason why I'm, I'm making an example about alcohol is that I was always making decisions sober minded. So as much as I would like the mm. finer things and all these nice things that I would buy, I always had a sober mind to understand that it's, what's important is me having a crib, a crib which was a place. And I remember at the time, Dane Fern was the, um, was the suburb to be at in Joburg, like Fours and Dane Fern. And yeah, I got myself a crib in Dane Fern. I uh, got myself a nice car. And I started changing cars, changing clothes. You know, I was very extravagant about my money. I used to take friends mm. out, used to go out a lot, used to spend money. You know, um, things that I don't do no more now because I know better and I know uh, the importance of every little cent that comes out. But back then, I never used to care. I mean, I used to buy everybody alcohol. I used to invite friends. I used to love entertaining. So even at my house, I always invite friends, entertain them, yeah. make sure everybody's got drinks, food, or sometimes we're going out or I'm the one that's indulging everybody. You know, I was just that type of a person giving, but at the same time, I was extravagant, which is a very bad formula if you would like to grow your money. You can't be a very generous person when it comes to money and on top of that you're extravagant then it means you're not going to be yeah. able to save money or invest money for yourself so as much as i was able to buy um my first crib and my second crib um when i was young i was also very extravagant in in, ex in my expenditures going out all the time you know as i was saying cars clothes all of those things that if you're not aware, your money will always just be spent and spent and spent and spent and before you know it when you look back you're like but I've, I've spent so much this year. I made a lot of money, but I don't have a lot to show for it. You know, the only thing that I guess I was um, smart about was investing in shelter because at least I was a homeowner. And at some point, as I did say, ended up owning more than one home. But still, if, if I wasn't that extravagant, I can imagine how much more money I could have been able to accumulate for myself. If I had a mindset of investing, I can imagine how much... Um, investments I could have gotten into, I could have been way further than I think where I am right now. Yeah. So when did the penny drop? Because obviously you're saying you're extravagant, you spent a lot, and you're basically taking care of everyone, uh, Ubud Matlisa, basically. When did the penny drop for you to say, this type of lifestyle is not sustainable? What was the that moment for you or a couple of events that led up to that realization? Geez, that's a very good question. Um, the epiphany for me happened, I would say when my daughter, my daughter was born, my first born was born, I was 34, 35, about a decade ago exactly. Yeah. I was also moving into business to start an energy drink company. And um, we started it with our own money, our own savings. When that happened, Simultaneously, I lost my TV and radio jobs. I was on Friends Like These, the biggest game show in the country. I had a very big show on Metro FM. I used to always get gigs and bookings. But the less and less people see you on TV, the less and less people hear you on the radio, even if you're releasing music, you don't have those resources of promoting your music. You don't have radio airtime. People don't hear you that often. You don't get as much gigs anymore and your income starts depreciating. And once my income started depreciating, also this business that we had started with my partner, we thought, well, I thought it would pop off quickly. You know, I thought we would make money very soon and easily. Little did I know that I'd gotten myself in the most difficult thing I'd ever gotten into, which is starting a business. And it was a manufacturing business and the South African entrepreneurship climate wasn't as it is now. It wasn't cool to be an entrepreneur at the time. The system was difficult. It was against entrepreneurship, I would say. The banks weren't so uh, kind and their systems also weren't so easy for us to be able to um, get money to grow our business. We tried government seed funding. We tried loans. We tried grant funding. We tried NEF. We tried the DTI. It was so difficult, so much so that I ended up even had to put my life in the entertainment industry on hold and just focus 100% on business with my business partner. Yeah. And when that happened, I guess, 
that was the big epiphany because now you don't have an income as much as you used to. You don't enjoy the privileges that you used to have. And for some reason, when you're outside of mainstream media and you're not releasing music as often as you used to, you don't have a hit records as you used to, you're not on TV anymore. You experience it quickly that the industry is fake, the entertainment industry. Overseas, they call it Hollywood. Here at home, our own Hollywood is fake. People stop yeah. taking your calls. Yeah. People stop wanting to associate with you anymore. And I was getting a lot of bad, bad and negative publicity. So people don't want to hang out with you anymore. People, you know, life just changes. Like, and um, it becomes some sort of a an eye opener. Yeah. You know, to say, hey, this is real life. This is how life is. Once you're no longer, you know, driving those smart cars, you're no longer on TV, you're no longer on radio. You know, people just turn on you for for whatever reason. And now that I've gotten older, I've, I've understood, and I'm not mad at anyone. But at yeah. the time, I was mad at everybody. I was like, but that's when it dawned in my mind that, you know, and then I started remembering all the money we used to make. And I started remembering all of the money I used to spend. And it sort of forced me to change my lifestyle. I mean, I moved on to a small apartment. Uh, I got rid of uh, other extravagant things that I had. For me to raise a bit of money, I put... Um, my property on, on, on the marketplace to sell it, to raise money. And, you know, property doesn't sell immediately. Yeah. It takes months first. Uh, and then my other two cars got repossessed. And, uh, yeah, life just changed drastically quickly. Like, in, in a space of six months, I moved Jeez. from being the man, right, into an epiphany, an epiphany that was an eye-opener and a wake-up call that says, you've got a child now. You are no longer the celebrity that you were. You are, you don't have top 10 music, you're not on radio, you're not on TV. You don't have these people on speed dial anymore because they mm. don't take your calls anymore. Man. You don't get invites to the hot and happening events anymore. So whether you like it or not, that is an eye opener and it's a wake up call. And it forces you to change your habits, to change how you spend money, to look at the baby that is just new, that is just coming to this earth, etc. So... That 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 is a, a sort of a long answer that I'll give you of my epiphany of how my money habits and um, yeah. behaviors changed. Man, that was a rude awakening, DJ's woo, and I mean a lot to deal with in a short space of time. From moving from soft life to pretty much almost the life you had before is not nice. You know, it's not yeah. nice at all. But um, yeah. you know, my mom instead of her sympathizing with me and my dad. They were glad that it happened. You know, as much as, yes, they're not happy to see their son go through whatever I was going through, but they were sort of glad that I was going through that because at a later stage, they did tell me, Khuri, you were just living in your own bubble. You were too nice to everyone. You were too giving to everyone. You were so naive, and you were just this person who was just living in his own world. And that celebrity life, we could foresee what is happening now, and we are glad that it happened while we're still alive and while you're still young for you to wake up and change your behavior. You are listening to More Than Money, a podcast collaboration brought to you by Sasfin Wealth. At Sasfin Wealth, we empower our clients to reach their global investment goals, to retire with dignity, and to leave a lasting legacy. If you would like to have real money conversations, visit sasfin.com forward slash wealth and talk to us. Enjoy the rest of the podcast. I want to talk about the emotions surrounding obviously feeling like your life is falling apart. People are not taking your calls anymore, whereas people used to be on speed dial and you could have access to them. What was your train of thought at that time? A roller coaster of emotions, right? Shame, embarrassment, anger, mad at people, disappointed. Some people I felt I had held on their lowest and nobody was there sort of for me. And I guess also I had to learn that um, I had some sort of self, self-entitlement self of thinking that people, you know, must treat me the way I treated them, must be as nice to me as I was nice to them. Ganti, you quickly learn that this is life. <laughs> you know, other people are not as you are. If you think you're a nice person, they're not as nice as you. Most people are around you for as much as you can give to them or you can be there for their own agenda, unless those who really, really care about you, which are a very, very few. And when all of those things happen, they chase themselves away. They just disappear, right? And then you get to really quickly see and learn life, what life is all about. And the older I've gotten, I've gotten to understand nobody owes me nothing. 
Nobody owed me to take my calls. Nobody owed me to invite me anywhere. Nobody owed me to help me. Nobody owed me nothing. You know, it's just subconsciously in my mind, I kind of felt maybe the way I was, and which is not my only fault. It's not, I'm not the only one with that type of a fault or who had that type of a thinking. I'm sure even yourself at some point, even some of the people that are watching now, most human beings are like that. We think other people should be there for us as much as we were there for them. We think because you helped them out, they'll remember you also in your time of need. We think people are as nice as we are. We think people are as compassionate, caring, kind as we are. And it doesn't make them bad people, but you must remember that people are not like you. People have got their own lives to live. They've got their own expenses. They've got their own plans. And nobody's entitled to help you or get you out of any problem. Nobody's, uh, just because you've helped them, nobody owes you nothing. Nobody owes you back a favor, right? So in the beginning, I was angry when those things were happening, especially in those early years. But as I've, I've, I've lived this life and gotten a bit older, as the years went by, as I was fully engulfed into me growing my business, I started understanding human nature and just how human beings are. Because I was angry with a lot of people for, for quite some time. But then I started understanding it's not their problem. It's my problem. I'm the one who was not disciplined yeah. with my money. I'm the one who was too kind. I'm the one who, be, who tried to please everybody. I was a people pleaser. I'm the one who thought I was Superman, who was just there for everyone. I'm just the one who was extravagant and who was irresponsible with his finances. And for me to even heal and get out of that um, situation and get better and become a better business person as I became this full-time business person, in my mind, I had to make peace with taking accountability, responsibility, and not shifting the blame or passing the buck. I had to take the responsibility myself and I had to accept my own mistakes that I had made for me to be able to start a renewal or a process of renewal of starting my life afresh. I feel even a lot of our young people right now are making those mistakes because we come from a certain poverty cycle and it's a mindset thing. That's why you even get somebody who wins 100 million in lottery. Five years later, you meet them, they don't have it anymore. That's why you get um, a lot of guests on I Blew It and they'll forever have guests. Why? Because it's not about the money that they'll give you, but it's a mindset that you have. Because even if we give you 100 million, even if we give you 10 billion, the mindset is not right for you to be able to multiply that money and double it up or invest it and do responsible things. You come from a poverty mindset that um, you are not taught a, a, a responsible, good relationship that you must have with money. You, your mindset also comes from a household maybe that says money is the root of all evil without you understanding. Actually, the love of money is the root of all evil. Uh, you thinking, scholar to gain to I can't have debt, right? And as you start being financially literate, you understand there's something called good debt and there's bad debt. You can actually use the good debt to en enrich yourself, to build wealth, right? But all of those little money habits that we grew up under, everybody comes from a certain household, it drops on off, off unto you. Those are the reasons why people go to I blew it, or those are the reasons why people win the lottery and they win millions, but they still blow it. It's all in the mindset. So you have to unlearn and relearn for you to be able to start afresh and do better. Talking about your business, you have an energy drink company and you're plowing money into this, you're plowing money into this. You have a daughter by now and like you said, your life spiraling out of control. What made you to keep going on building your business, even when it was really difficult? I didn't have any other choice. All of my public social currency, or you can call it for lack of a better word, celebrity currency, was poured into this brand, was poured into this small fire thing, was poured into my business. So much so that at times when we wanted to give up with my partner, I used to tell him, like, we can't, bro. Like, we have to find another way to make this work. Like, the fact that things are not doing well right now, there's no giving up. Like, it taught me resilience, right? So sometimes you are caught between a rock and a hard place and you've got your back against the wall and you don't have your finances right and you're going through the most and you are forced to not give up. And I write about it in my book. I write about your why. What is your why? Right now, a lot of motivational speakers say, we say that all the time, inspirational speakers, that... um. If your why is big enough, you'll keep going. And my why was big enough because I used to look at my firstborn. She was like little. And I used to look at um, me not being on mainstream media anymore, not having top 10 music anymore. I knew that um, 
I don't have the tools and the resources that I used to have for me to continue maintaining my celebrity and reputation because that's the one that brings money. That's the one that brings opportunities. I could see that everything that I'd worked hard for all these years was invested in this Mofire brand and business that I did not have any other choice but to not give up. And every time when I wanted to give up, my partner would lift me up, encourage me, be there for me. We used to be on, on the phone, uh, long phone calls, an hour, sometimes even almost two hours over the phone, things not going great. You know, sometimes when you don't have money for airtime, you don't have money for data, you don't even have money for petrol. It was one of those. Uh, at some point, I remember even at some point, I did not even have a car for quite some time. So it's not easy to grow a business. You know, it requires a lot of sacrifice. And some at some point, even when the business was sort of turning around and starting to do a little bit okay, you get to learn and understand it's not your money, it's the business's money. So everything you're doing, you're doing for this dream, for this business. And I made peace with the fact that it's not my business. It's a, a legacy for the future, not only for my kids, but it's just for the future generation. So... I had to be strong. I had to delay gratification. I had to understand that it's, you know, you sacrifice short-term gains for long-term success. I had to um, make peace with the fact that some of my peers were doing well. They were traveling the world. They were breaking into international markets. They were getting opportunities in the U.S., in Europe, overseas. And there's a new generation also of entertainers that are now on the top 10. You know, I just had to make peace with all of those things that life has changed. And these are the cards that you've dealt. And these are the decisions that you've made. And everything has culminated into you growing this baby. This is your vision. This is your baby. And that's why in my mind... I became so resilient, even when I would be out there, even when I'm, I'm sharing about my story. But simultaneously, I never, you know, I never gave up. I started writing books about my journey. I started sharing the books and, you know, tried as much as I could to create multiple streams of income. You know, I'd be selling books. I'd be getting talks. And so much so that people started knowing me more as an inspirational speaker and entrepreneur more than a DJ or a radio TV presenter or celebrity. Then I started creating a new revenue of income where I get booked to come and give talks. People buy my books. Some people who can't afford to pay me, maybe they'll say, we'll buy 100 books. Can you just come and give a talk? We'll buy 500 books for our audiences or for, for our, our employees. Just come and give a talk. You know what I mean? So I found different ways on how to hustle while I was learning this business thing and while I was sharing all of the information that I was learning through my challenges of growing a manufacturing company with my partner. I was pouring all of that knowledge and experience and my failures and successes onto my books. Yeah, and then I just evolved into this different person all the way up until uh, just before lockdown, I decided to go through a self-discovery journey to go find out who I am, to go search for my family tree, to just grow in my spiritual journey in I what I call self-love. You know, and in my self-love journey, I I learned so much. I mean, I traveled the continent. I went to the most important countries that I'd always wanted to visit in the continent. Did Egypt, did Ethiopia, did East Africa, Kenya, did Tanzania. And then I started following and um, searching for my own family tree started consulting my elders to get to understand who's my father's father, who's their parents, who were their parents and their parents. And that's been a journey that has taken me five to seven years to sort of find the family tree. And I've gone about five generations back, which was an incredible job that I've done. So, yeah, you know, I started learning so many things and it started manifesting itself even in my appearances where I started growing my hair. I started not combing my beard. I started becoming a tree hugger. I started loving nature more. I started going down the rabbit hole of African spiritual history. And then just slowly, I just started changing and becoming this person that uh, a lot of people were not ready for. And I'm glad I went down that rabbit hole. You just sound like you are refreshed. Does that make sense? Because, you know, as I'm talking to you, it sounds like you have had a new water on you type of thing. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yes, ma'am, it does. And I'm humbled to hear your words. Uh, my mom has always said to me, you know, the throne all the blessings. You are blessed to become a blessing unto other children. And everything that you touch will always become a success. And that's what I've always lived, even in the entertainment industry my career. I've just always been that person. Like everything I touch succeeds. Everything I do, I'll always come out at the top. But no matter how many hurdles I have to go over, how many challenges I'm going to have to overcome, 
even that mindset helped me in uh, building Mofai, even on difficult times when we wanted to shut down the business almost with my partner. Like, we can't fail. We can't fail. We will be known as these guys who tried to start a manufacturing business or an energy drink business and we failed. We'll always be known as those guys. We can't fail. And that's how we sort of kept on pumping ourselves up over the years. And um, it's also very important, you know, the names that you give to your children. And um, till today, I mean, I always say to people, my mission statement uh, is linked to my name, you know, Gungu so I'm blessed to become a blessing and my mission in this world or my purpose is to change people's lives because I was born for purpose. And so because I understand what my name means and my mission statement on this earth, my purpose is attached to my name, it makes it easier even for me to make business decisions and life lessons or family decisions because then I'm living in my purpose. Profits before purpose is a recipe for disaster. I've learned that it's actually the other way around. When money is rooted in service, you'll always be lacking. Because no matter how much money you can attain, no matter how much wealth you can accumulate, you'll always be lonely. But when your purpose is rooted in service, in serving others, in being for purpose, in, 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 in wanting to see other people's lives succeed, in, in, in doing whatever you're doing for a bigger why, for a bigger cause, then money chases you. You can't get away from it. And that's, for me, the biggest blessing ever. Yes, yes. Now, talking about your troubles, I remember one time here at the studios when, you know, you had come in for something completely different. We had a really, really small chat uh, where we were talking about the tax man. How have you overcome that and how important now in your businesses to know that, you know what, with the tax man, you have to give them their cut? So it's not about giving the tax man their cut. It's paying what's due and then giving yourself your cut, maybe if that's a better way to put it. Because whether you like it or not, we are living around the, the, the laws that govern South Africa, even the tax laws. Everybody has to pay tax. And if there's one thing that I regret as an entrepreneur or an inspirational speaker or even an author, I have not focused on enough in my career is a tax subject. But then again, you know, you, you learn and you do better, but then I also hope those that come after me or behind me will do better in terms of understanding, getting the right people to help you with your taxes, filing your returns every year. Maybe just the simplest way I can put it is when you're about to start anything, entrepreneurship or a business or a career in entertainment or in soccer or in anything, two things, those are the most important people in your life until you die. Your lawyer, legal advice, and your accountant, financial advice, those two things. So somebody's going to have your books in order. Somebody's going to uh, maybe link you to the right people in terms of getting investment or financial advice. You are blessed and lucky if your accountant has got those expertise as well. And somebody who's going to give you legal advice. Those are the two people that will determine if um, your life becomes a success or a failure. Same as when people say things like the type of partner you choose to marry and spend the rest of your life. They either make you or break you. What you consider selling a stake in your company or perhaps being bought out as part of a legacy or your strategy is we're going to hold this company until the fruits start coming, even if it's years later? Uh, it depends, right? So when you're in a business like mine where you're not the only sole owner, you've got other shareholders who are your partners, ideas differ and depends on where the business is and how far it's grown. Other people decide to share, to sell. Other people decide to sell within, you know, the very same shareholders. Other people decide to go raise money, grow the business. Other people decide to go public. Other people decide to sell and move on to other things. But for me, I look at this as because I've also been a part of getting the business and the brand out there as its ambassador and a marketer and somebody who co-founded the business, it'll always be attached to my name, right? So it wouldn't be a good idea to sell all of my shares, even if maybe at some point to raise a bit of money, you, we might sell a stake here and there, maybe in the future. But I don't see myself as somebody who's going to sell entirely and get out of that business. Even if I get into other businesses and I grow, I kind of feel um, in terms of legacy, in terms of a beautiful South African story of a brand that started from the streets of Johannesburg, Ekasi, it's a beautiful story to share at a business class or a marketing master class somewhere or uh, inspire future generations in this country or future entrepreneurs. So because it'll always be attached to my name, I wouldn't um, sell all of my shares. Is there anything that you are still afraid of when it comes to money? 
I've been through it all. Like um, God has been good. It's been great lessons. And I think the amount of experience that I've acquired, I'm also not stingy with information. That's why I write books. That's why I give talks, public talks. And, you know, I share the knowledge with my kids, with some of my mentees, young people that I mentor. You know, I've also heard of other people and business owners who've gone through bigger problems or upheavals or money problems way bigger than I've, I could have ever fathomed, you know. So I don't even know what the future holds, but I'm now, I would say, better than I was as far as my financial literacy knowledge is concerned. My literacy, my, my knowledge is, and my relationship with money is way different than it was. My behavior with money is now different, you know, um, and I don't know what, what um, the future holds, but I do know that as, as we grow, anything can happen. So it's not necessarily a matter of just saving for a rainy day, but it's a matter of making sure that if you drop dead today, at least you've secured a great future for um, your descendants, you know? Looking at where you started as a young boy in Tembisa, like you said, and dreaming of this big life, you got the big life, you lost the big life, you found yourself, started businesses, wrote books, and so many things are still ahead of you. Would you say that you are proud of yourself? Yes, ma'am. God has been good. That's why I'm always grateful every day. I always say just waking up for me is a blessing. And all the lessons that came with this life thing to teach me to be, to be the man that I am. And uh, I'm still very young. You know, um, in the next half a decade or so, I'll be 50. And I still see somebody who's 50, who's not a young, a young person as they used to be, but I still don't regard 50 as old. In your 20s, in your 30s, in your 40s, you're more than allowed to make mistakes. You're more than allowed to get up, dust yourself up, and don't be too hard on yourself. You know, sometimes um, don't have this mindset of it's over, it's the end, uh, having suicidal thoughts. It's all not worth it. Like uh, the difficulties and the hardships that I've been through in my life, there was moments where I kind of felt like, I'll never get out of this situation. And that's why they say time heals all. And because as time goes on, you get to understand that what I went through was nothing compared to maybe what I'm going through now. Or it was nothing compared to what other people go through. So everything is just a, a lesson. Life happens. We call it life happening. Life happens to shape you and make you become the person that you would like to become. But remember, you shape your own life with your daily decisions. You shape your own life with um, not eating another chocolate. There's nothing wrong with eating chocolate, just making an example. Uh, with eating more chocolates and more chocolates and drinking more alcohol and more alcohol and just eating more makunya, more makunya, more acha, more acha, out all the time, out all the time, driving and just, you know, the more you do anything, you got to learn that you got to do things in moderation. You know, nothing wrong with um, going to the gym three times a week, nothing wrong with eating healthy, you know, cheating once in a while on weekends. You can have your drink, your wine, you can have your chocolate here and there, but just understanding everything in moderation, looking after yourself, eating right, reading books, training, uh, indulging in personal development content, watching content that grows you, watching the right podcasts, reading books, hanging around people that grow you, that challenge you mentally, dreaming big, wanting to become a better person, jogging, you know, all the right things to do. A lot of people do know those things. It's just a matter of we don't put action, right? So, uh, I encourage people to start um, changing their lives through the little decisions that they make on a daily basis. It's all in your mind. Whatever you say it is, it is. If you say it's impossible, then it's impossible. If you say you can't do it, then you can't do it. If you're saying you can, then it means you can. So it's all in your mind and it's whatever you say with your mouth. So mindset, your habits, and it is all about choice. DJ Boo, you have been amazing. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, may God bless you and thank you very much for having me on your wonderful platform. This was a Sassfin Wealth Podcast. Visit sassfin.com forward slash wealth for more information.